Good morning. It's always a joy to come here and be with you. You are very friendly, very kind, and uh, since we all have God's love within us, right, that makes a big difference in our fellowship. There's a song, I hope you don't get tired of me, I'd like to sing. <laughs> and there's a song I'd like to sing for you today, If That Isn't Love. And it was written by Dottie Rambo many, many years ago. She was a gospel singer for many years, wrote hundreds of songs, and she passed away. She passed away in an in a accident with the bus that she was driving with her music people and about two or three years ago. But this is an older song that she, she wrote, If That Is In Love, and I Hope You Enjoy It. Her father had a drinking problem. He was an alcoholic, and he was not nice to her when she was growing up. But she had a mother who loved Jesus, and in the end, when his, her father finally accepted the Lord, but she suffered for many years from the abuse of her own earthly father. But when she experienced the love of Jesus Christ, that changed everything. He left the splendor of heaven, knowing his destiny. Twas the lonely hill of Golgotha, there to lay down. His life for me If that is in love The ocean is dry There's no stars in the sky And the sparrow can't fly if that is in love, then heaven's a myth. There's no feeling like this. If that is in love, I like these words. Even in death, he remembered the thief hanging by his side he spoke with love and compassion then he took him to paradise if that is in love the ocean is dry there's no stars in the sky and the sparrow can't fly if that is in love then heaven a myth. There's no feeling like this if that is in love. There's no feeling like this if that is in Love. Yesterday was my older brother's funeral. I had a part in it. And in a sense, it was a sad day. But in another sense, it was a glad day. Because we know where he's at. 
I'm 76, but he's 80, he was 81. And for the last two and a half years, sometimes I didn't know if he even knew me anymore. He could no longer walk by himself. He was in a home, senior community. And he got to a place where I prayed, Lord, take him home. He's lived his life here. He has seven grandchildren and nine great-grandchildren. They were all there yesterday. And so I've been going down memory lane because I remember my brother over the years. He was very kind to me as a younger brother. He played five different instruments. He loved gospel music, sang and had different music groups. He taught me how to play the guitar many years when I was 10 years old. And he helped me to have a love in my heart for gospel music, Christian music. So he's in heaven. My wife is in heaven. My parents are in heaven. And a whole lot of other people that I've known in the past are in heaven waiting for us and for me. In the meantime, we as God's people, we live on. How do we live? Well, there's three words I want to live with you, leave with you today to help us to understand the importance of God's word in our lives. This Bible was my first Bible <laughs> as a Christian when I was, when I was uh, 15, almost 16, 1956. October of 1956, I was in the hospital in Norristown. And I received Jesus Christ in my heart. I saw a man die in my room while I was there. He was lost. He had no confidence about where he was going. And I was living a backslidden life. I was raised in the church. But it was that day when I remembered my parents left their Bibles beside me in my bed in the hospital there in Norristown. And this was not the Bible, but this was my sister's Bible. When I started reading the Bible, she gave me her old Bible. She got a new Bible. And so I've used this Bible for many years and read it. Now I have lots of Bibles, different translations. And so I've been studying the Bible now for all these years, since 1956. There's not a day that goes by when I don't open up the Bible and read it or study it. So I'd like us to uh, think about the importance of Bible teaching. We get together on the Lord's Day on every week, right, for the most part, and we hear the Word of God. Those of us who teach it and preach it, we do it with delight. There isn't anything I like to do more than talk about the Bible. Talk about Jesus and how he changed my life. I'm going to turn to 1 Timothy chapter 4, uh, verses 4 through 7. And this is the type of life that the New Testament Christians lived. It says, For every creature of God is good. And nothing is to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. This book is a most powerful book we'll ever read. Prayer is a very powerful activity that we take part in as God's people. But it says, if you instruct the brethren in these things, you will be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished in the words of faith and of the good doctrine which you have carefully followed. But reject profane and old wives' fables and exercise yourself toward godliness. What is the difference between us and the non-Christian? The person who doesn't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. What is the big difference anyway? We have God's love within us. We experience it. The non-Christian only has man's type of love, which is very deficient. It's not 
always as helpful as it should be. And so when we receive Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, as I did in October 1956, the Holy Spirit came to live within me, and the Bible says we're born again by the Spirit of God. So the Spirit of God lives within us, and as I will notice in closings of verses, that the Holy Spirit teaches us the Word of God. Now, teachers are important. Everybody who stands here on Sunday morning teaches the Word of God. That's important. But the Holy Spirit teaches us when we read the Bible for ourselves. The Holy Spirit helps us to understand what we're reading. And so as a young person, as a teenager, I began to read the Bible. I started reading a little bit of the Psalms every day. Maybe a chapter or two out of the Psalms. So every day I would read from the Proverbs, a couple Proverbs. And then I would go to the New Testament in Matthew and I'd read a couple chapters from there. And then I started reading through the New Testament. But I never got to the Old Testament until a, a year later. And it was probably a good thing. Because there's so much to understand, first of all, about Jesus and salvation and all those other things in the New Testament. So I began to grow in my faith. And as I studied the Bible, I heard preachers on the radio and television, heard preachers at church. And this was all good. But if we as God's people do not find time each day to read the Bible, we are the ones who, who need it. We need to study the Bible every day for ourselves. And uh, thank God I, I have the privilege of talking about the Bible today and talking about how the New Testament Christians lived. They lived by the Word of God. Now, for 20 years, I was with a mission called Pocket Testament League. And uh, we would go to the Liberty Bell one or two days a week. For several years, we did that. We would get out a special gospel of John with a Liberty Bell on it. And there were people who came there from all over the world. And we would give them out. We had permission to do that. And people got the word of God. But there was a school teacher there with her class one day. And this goes back, mind you, back to the 1980s. There was a school teacher with her te uh, the students there one day. She says, no, you can't, you can't give these to these students. I said, why not? I'm telling you, you can't give them. And I said, okay. That was sad, right? That was back in the 1980s already. There's a lot of people who, who do not want other people to read the Word of God because this is the, word, the book that's going to change our lives. It's going to tell us the most important things that we can ever learn about in our own lives. And God put a hunger in my heart to know more and more about Him. But guess what? When I was a missionary in Brazil... I forgot to bring one in Portuguese. Brazil is Portuguese language. And we gave out 14 million of these in Brazil. And uh, told people every day about Jesus and about the Bible. Now, in the, in the New Testament, we notice in Acts chapter 18, they had a teaching ministry. And I'm going to turn to Acts chapter 18, starting at verse 1, quickly. And I'm going to read a couple of these verses about what they were doing in the New Testament times. Remember, that was the beginning of the Church of Jesus Christ on Pentecost. And then after Pentecost, people were studying their Old Testament, and, they, and then uh, little by little, different uh, men were writing New Testament uh, letters and books. So in Acts chapter 18, starting at 1, it says, After these things, Paul departed from Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome, and he came to them. So because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked. For the occupation, they, by occupation, they were tent makers. Paul was a tent maker, and he was also an apostle. 
It says, he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded both Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, Paul was compelled by the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. I have Jewish friends. Some of them are believers, and some of them yet do not believe in the Messiah. I also have a lot of uh, <clears throat> other people who are friends who are non-Jewish. Some of them believe in Jesus, some of them don't. I have neighbors. Some are believers in Jesus, but most are not. I remember the day in the town where I was born and raised in Harlesville that 90% or more of the people went to church every Sunday. Most of them were Christians. Today, 12% go to church. And it has grown by thousands and thousands of people over the years. The town where I was born and raised. And my heart goes out to my neighbors. We have a community uh, party every year. And it will all they come together by the hundreds. They have food, they have music, loud music. But they also have alcohol. But the fact of it is, I walk around, I know a lot of the people. They know me. They see me as a community parson. There was one gentleman who would walk down our street a number of years ago, back and forth with his wife They would, in the evenings or on the weekends for exercise. He had a heart attack. He was from Philadelphia, moved up to our area for a job many years ago. He died of a heart attack. They were not involved in the church. So the wife asked me to do the funeral service in Satterton. What did I talk about at the funeral service? Guess what? I gave a message about Jesus Christ, about salvation. The daughter of this gentleman worked at the bank in Culpsville with a member of our church. And she told the member of our church, the daughter, your pastor spoke about Jesus at my dad's funeral. She said, I never knew anything about this before. And we tried to help her to understand that she too could receive Jesus if she wanted to. And so uh, over the years, I've done funerals for people who were Christians and people who weren't Christians. If they weren't Christians, I couldn't say that they were believers, that they were in heaven. But yesterday, I could say to everybody, my relatives and friends in Satterton Mennonite Church, I could tell everybody there that my brother was in heaven. How, did, how could I say that? Because in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, it says to be absent from the body is to be what? Present with the Lord. And in Luke, he talks about, he sends angels, transports those who for, go from this life to next life, transports them to one of two places. But I have confidence that the nurse who was my brother, uh, Saturday, uh, two weeks ago, he died peacefully. I've been with people who died unpeacefully. But every Christian that I've ever known I've been with as a pastor, when they died, they all died peacefully. Why? Because they know where they're going and they have that assurance that they're going to be with Jesus and all those who have gone before us who are also believers. So here we have in the New Testament, we have those who are preaching the gospel in synagogues trying to reach Jewish people with the gospel. But in verse 6 it says, when they, there were people who opposed this. When they opposed him and blasphemed, he shook his garments and said to them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. 
And he departed from there and entered the house of a certain man named Justice, one who worshipped God, whose house was next door to the synagogue. Then Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord (coughs) with all his household. And many of the Christians, (coughs) hearing, believed and were baptized. I have friends (coughs) from Philadelphia over the years where I did much ministry on the streets and in the prisons and in churches. (coughs) Excuse me, I have to get some water. They were students at Temple University back in the 60s or 70s in there somewhere. The young man was a Christian. He started befriending a Jewish girl, a student at uh, Temple University. And um, he led her to Christ. He told her about his faith in Christ. She became a believer. Her parents were very upset. But her father, who was Jewish, finally accepted Jesus Christ. <clears throat> but his, her mother never, accept, never accepted Jesus. She rejected what she heard till the day she died. The father's name was Abraham. Can you believe it? And when he went to heaven, guess who he probably wanted to meet first, other than Jesus and others? Abraham, right? The same name that he had. But I was very sad that the wife of Abraham never received Jesus Christ. That's so sad. But if the Bible is true, that's the way it is. Jesus, what did he say in John 14? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man, no one comes to the Father but by me, through me. And so my concern over the years has been that we share the message of Jesus Christ with as many people as we possibly can. But there are going to be people who are going to be upset with this when we do this. But that's okay. So we need to, first of all, know the Bible then we need to defend the Bible, as we saw in those two verses from 1 Peter chapter 3. And then we need to live the Bible, what it teaches us. Live it in our everyday lives. And this is the way it works. This is the way it goes. And so when we look at Acts chapter 18, I'm going to read uh, four verses here out of Acts to the end of the chapter. Now, a certain Jew named Apollos, born in Alexandria, an eloquent man, mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord, being fervent in the spirit. He spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord, though he knew only the baptism of John. This was a man who wanted to know the truth. The Bible says... If a person seeks truth, they're going to find it. So he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Aquila and Priscilla heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. When he desired to cross to Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him. And when he arrived, he greatly helped those who had believed through grace. For he vigorously refuted the Jews publicly showing from the scriptures that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. He is the Christ. Jesus is the Christ. Now my brother, his name was Darwin. When he was 28 years of age, he already had five children. His wife was already a believer, but he wasn't. He was into music. He played all kinds of instruments. He loved gospel music, but he also liked country music, and that's what he sang most of at that time. He sang mostly country music. 
I learned the guitar from him, and I also learned a lot of country music. But when he was 28 years of age, he had already been taking his family, his children, to church all the years of their marriage. But a good friend of mine that I had as, as a professor or a teacher in, in Bible college, he came to Satterton to be a pastor in the church where my brother was a member. And he, he led my brother to Christ. He had been sitting in church all his life. He heard all kinds of evangelists. He sang a lot of gospel music for years. But when he was 28, he finally saw the light that he needed a personal relationship with God. He put on a good front. I thought he was a pretty good guy myself. But when he became a believer at 28, went to the church to talk to the pastor, my friend, who was my professor in Bible college, he accepted Jesus Christ. And from then, he started singing almost all the time gospel music. Not that there's anything wrong with country music, you follow me? It can be bad, but most of it's all right, I guess. But he began to sing gospel music. Formed music groups, sang. But when he took sick two and a half years ago, he no longer played his guitar. He no longer sang. So finally they took him to the, the Abington Hospital in Lansdale, which we used to call North Penn Hospital, two weeks ago. And the nurse was my neighbor's daughter, or a good friend of mine, their daughter. She was working with hospice in the hospital at the time. There. So my brother's nurse was a good friend of our, my wife and myself. She grew up in a family that was Christian. and So he, my brother looked at her and said, what is, he barely even talked, he hardly ever talked anymore since he took sick two and a half years ago. And I didn't even know always if he even knew any, if he knew who I was anymore. It was kind of sad. But he asked, opened his eyes, came out of his coma momentarily, and said to this nurse, what is your favorite song? <laughs> Even in his last hours, he was thinking about the music that he loved. What is your favorite song? I think it was something like How Great Thou Art or something that she said. Now he wrote a lot of music. And we sang a couple of his songs. One of his daughters sings and plays piano that lives in California. She was back. And um, then she said to him, what is your favorite song? And he told her, but she didn't recognize it because it was one of his songs. And we sang his songs yesterday at the funeral. But guess what? He went back into the coma and that was the last words that anybody spoke with him about. But the fact of it is that music is a very powerful medium today in our world. God uses music and Satan uses music, as we know. But I'm going to close and, and look and turn to 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. I've taught the Bible in prisons for 43 years. This Thursday, I go to Greater Ford Prison. Um, I have a Bible class there. And many years ago, God led me to a couple verses here. How can I help these fellows understand the Word of God better? You know, all kinds of... Since I started going into Greater Ford in 1943 when I came home from Brazil, um... All kinds of people have gotten involved in prison ministry at Montgomery County Prison. We have about 150 volunteers that go in there that do Christian activities. At Greater Ford, we used to have 500, but the governor a number of years ago, or his in charge at the state prisons, cut it down half to that. 
So we don't have as many volunteers anymore. We're not allowed to have as many volunteers as we used to have in the state prisons. Well, so God, I was seeking God about how can I help these fellows understand the Bible because most of them never even read a Bible before they came to prison. And so it says here in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 25, and this is the promise that he has promised us, eternal life. These things I have written to you concerning those who tried to deceive you. But, verse 27, this is the verse I want you to hear. The anointing which you have received from him, from God, that's the Holy Spirit, abides in you, and you do not need anyone teach you. Teachers are good. But as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things and is true and is not a lie, and just as it has taught you, you will abide in him. So the Holy Spirit wants to teach us the word of God. If we're only willing to read it, if we're only willing to spend time reading it every day. I know we're busy. We have a lot of activities that are important. Now for me, I live in the country, so to speak, and I have a back porch, and when the weather's like this in the morning, I like to go out, take my Bible with me, and sit on the porch, listen to the birds sing, and just read God's Word and pray. I don't think there's anything more beautiful in, in life than to have this personal relationship with Jesus. And the men and women that I have worked with over the years in prisons, they desperately need this. My neighbors desperately need this. But as far as I know, all my nieces and nephews know Jesus Christ. All my brothers and sisters know Jesus Christ. And I'm so thankful for that. Now I'm working on my three grandchildren. <laughs> And the, the granddaughters, uh, last weekend I was up, up in, uh, they live up near <coughs> Freehold, Homedale. And they had a birthday party of Friday, uh, Saturday a week ago up there for my two granddaughters who are now four years of age. And uh, they, hear, they hear about my wife, Nana, because my daughter was pregnant with them when my wife, Daisy, passed away. So they hear about Nana and they say, Pop, Pop, where's Nana? I said, she's in heaven. Then my grandson ch uh, chimes in. He's six years old. He already's heard about, he's already conversed about this because he knew my wife before she died. But guess what? He tried to explain to his little sisters, well, Nana's in heaven, but she can't come and visit us. Someday when we go to heaven... Then we'll see Nana. And so I haven't gotten to the place yet where I can tell my grandchildren, well, Jesus died on the cross. That's going to have to come later. But the fact of it is there's so much to teach children. I stopped at the bookstore for a birthday gift for my granddaughters. Guess what I got? Stories out of the Bible. Children's stories out of the Bible. I got three of them. Because they like pop-pop and and Auntie Lou and others to read them stories. So I'm going to be reading them stories children's, out of a children's book about the Bible. And I want them to understand more about the Bible. That's my responsibility. So I just wanted to encourage you today that you have a wonderful church. You have wonderful fellowship here. But we have a responsibility for our relatives, for our family members, for our neighbors, people we work with or whatever, study with. Every opportunity God gives me, I try to share the love of Jesus with other people. I don't get into these theological arguments with them. It's a waste of time. If they want to know more about it, I, say, I do this, I say this. I'll tell you what Jesus did for me. He changed my life. And he can change your life. He can make you a new person. When my parents, uh, when my parents, uh, back in 1951, went to, a, we had a big evangelistic outreach. I'm closed with this. I already went over time. 
Thousands of people came to a tent, a big, huge tent they put in Franconia Hill. There were as many as 6,000 people were coming to hear about preaching and gospel in a tent in 1951. My parents were already part of a church many years. God touched their hearts in a new way. My father stopped smoking cigars. <laughs> he stopped losing his temper because we lived on a farm growing up. I saw a big change. My father got involved in prison ministry and got involved in a Christian businessmen's uh, meetings and organizations. My mother one time woke us up at 3 o'clock in the morning when we were just young. She was so concerned about whether we really were ready to meet the Lord if he should come back. She woke us up at 3 o'clock in the morning. I told the people yesterday about that, and they were amazed. My mother passed away many years ago now. But the fact of it is, I was a blessed person. I grew up in a Christian home. But so many people I talked to, they had never even heard about Jesus Christ. And they live in America. They live in our communities. So we have a response. Father, we thank you today for bringing us here together to hear about you. Father, we just prayed you would bless these dear people here in Huntington Valley and wherever they live. That you would keep us strong in our faith. That we will learn more and more about you each day. Thank you for this time together today. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.